see if I can show you this here in the video. We faced the part like we did in the first part of the program and we drilled halfway through the part. And kind of the reasoning behind this, if I can demonstrate this, let's see if I can show it to you. You can see it. See the parts up against that jaw pretty good. See the gap? You can see that between that jaw. Because in order to get the, the part to stick out straight from the chuck, it's not too bad on that jaw. Um, it's up there pretty tight on that one. So it's kind of kind of got a gap on a couple of these jaws, I think, or, or maybe just that one. Now see that one. So those two jaws have a gap there and I don't want to do this heavy roughing and be pushing back against the part or the, you know, and have it shift in the jaws for some reason. And also I want to drill this hole halfway up so when I drill the other hole from the other side, they'll meet. And then when I'm, I'm roughing the bore, the shavings have somewhere to go actually that way up into the spindle and it doesn't pack up with shavings in there when I actually bore the ID. The ID is not critical. It could be drilled even, but I don't have a drill the right size and, and boring it actually leaves a nicer finish than the drilling. And I can chamfer the front of it at the same time like you saw when I made the program. So right now I got to uh, take this out and flip it around and, and indicate it in reasonably true. It doesn't matter, this hole is like a two and a sixteenth drill and the hole gets bored out to two and a half inches so the run out isn't too critical as far as that hole goes or even this face so much but i do want this face up against the shoulders and the jaws that is important i got the crane on here take a little bit of tension on it part is um, about 900 and something pounds the blank of material so don't want to lose control of it Loosen these jaws. Loosen the one jaw. This is the number one jaw. And the number four jaw. Always try to loosen the same two jaws so I don't have to indicate too much when I turn things around. Oop, didn't have much tension on the crane. Now, I have found that if I back off these two jaws just a little bit, about that much that it makes things just a little bit easier to indicate Let's see if I can get this turned around Now, I'm going to jog the machine up here and, and get a little help to push it up into the chuck because it's kind of heavy for me to hold this part. And if I'm careful here, I wouldn't recommend doing this and not being very careful doing it. I mean, you can overload the axis on the push a little bit harder. I'm kind of watching the load meter on the display there so I don't overload anything. I take a tension on these jaws. Get a pretty good, not a real hard tension, but enough to hold the part. Let's back the Z-axis off. Now I'm going to lower the crane watching what's happening here. I don't want it to fall out of the chuck. 
fuck, because I don't have lots of tension on the jaws. But I'm going I'm to run it out here just to look at it. It's like it's running out probably about 20 thousandths indicated run out, more or less. Which is fine. It's going to be fine. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reset the, um, the Z zero on the fixture offset. Get it in the right, uh, so it's going to clean up because we already faced some of the material off the other end of the part. And we saw when I showed you the jaws that it wasn't a, it was actually not up against the chuck. All right, what we're going to do is run this up till we get a reading. And then we're going to turn the C axis till we get the minimum distance here. See, so that's coming up into the indicator. It's going away. Right about there. I'm going to set the I'm going to back off and come back on the indicator and come up to zero or teach the zero minus 30 thousandths more that way. Input. And so we're setting it plus 30 thousandths right now with the indicator. All right. So now should be ready to start. Restart the program and, and let it face and drill up to the hole we already drilled, and then complete the operation. Before I go any further, I'm going to check to see if I can uh, make it down here without hitting the jaws. This is about where it goes to, so it should clear easily. Just want to make sure of that, and I'm going to restart the program uh, for this roughing cycle.
finish roughing out the OD with that tool there. That's what it looks like. Let's see if I can shine a light down here. I might be able to see the hole that met the other hole. So we got that drilled. And because the chip conveyor is not working, this is the, see that normally is down that low. Now it's almost up to the door level here. The machine, you have to shovel that out. All right, I want to touch a little bit on the cam soft or on this side of the part. First thing we do is face the part, rough face it down. Now I'm going to show you an alternate uh, 
procedure that I, I started to do on the other parts that I think is better than this, but face it down, then we kind of rough finish that face and rough finish this face. There's a reason for this because I don't want to drag the 35 degree diamond tool only has like a five degree lead angle when it's going backwards up a face like this. And so if you leave the roughing tool marks and everything, I'll put a picture in here of that. You know, the roughing tool takes passes down here and it leaves a wavy or bumpy surface from its passes. And that 35 degree diamond will kind of follow that contour almost, if you will. So I take these roughing passes two thousandths off the face they're kind of rough finish passes, if you will. And then come back and I do a, a full finish pass like this all the way up the face and the uh, diameter. But now, like I said, I changed that and I'll show you what I did that I think is better than that. And then we rough board it, finish bore it, drill these holes, rough drill them because I didn't have the same, the right size drill again here. And then, then we mill them out to 780 thousandths finished size with a half inch end mill. You'll see that in the um, machining part of the part that I was doing. Same group of parts, but it's different. It's, it's shorter and, it, and it's um, got a longer step here. But what I did on the roughing cycle that I think is better is I, I roughed in a, a horizontal direction just down to this 10 inch diameter like this, like you see in the blue here. And that way I could run it in low range See, because the other one I was running all in low range because this is a 16 inch diameter in it and it takes a fair amount of power to face down here. And this I can run in low range to get the torque I need. And then I did the facing cuts going down to the center of the part in high range so I can get a higher surface footage when I come down to the middle of the part. And this, um, this worked better. It, it um, was easier on the insert too, because it's going at a lot higher RPM down here in the middle. I roughed and rough finished these two faces, like I said before, and then I, I took this finished pass all the way up here, but if you look carefully, see this black line here is the actual finish size, and this is the diameter that that's cutting to. And then I did this finish cut just to establish the close tolerance in, in one little cut here, so I didn't have to rerun this whole all these facing cuts coming up here because if you run this like the second time or something like that it tends to vibrate up here because it's not cutting any material when a tool's not got any force against it it tends to want to chatter easier than if it has a little bit of pressure against it so that's the um the cam side of this thing and we already saw the cad in the first video of this and, and I didn't do anything different for that. I already had changed its diameter back here to the middle of the tolerance. So let's get to the machine. A little bit too high. I just kind of get it started in there. Wiggle it up in there a little bit, and it, it won't fall out now. It kind of has captured good enough of the jaws, I can take the strap out. Get rid of the crane. Now I can kind of work it up in here. I'm just going to work it up in here to the end of this bushing right there. And then I'm going to start snugging up the jaws. I'm not going to tighten them very tight because I want to be able to tap this thing around a little bit. You're going to see in a minute, i got to tap the flange to run true in the back here. i put the tool holder I use for the indicator here. I'm going to index the B axis down 45. Then I'm going to use this other, uh, this interrapid indicator here only because my other one is, is acting up on me for some weird reason. So let's see if I can use this one. 
and do what I need to do. Maybe, we'll see. I've got a, um, I may have to buy another one and then get that one, uh, get that one repaired because it's, uh, I don't know, there's something weird with it. It's acting up. You can actually see it easier than I can because I'm like, that's why, that's kind of like why I like to use the vertical indicator because I can kind of point it out towards me here. Okay, this is, uh, that's going into the indicator. So I'm going to hit it down here on the bottom of the flange. I'm going to kind of re-zero this. I'm not worrying about the run out in the chuck yet. I'm going to get this fairly close. It might not be flat on it. You can kind of see a little bit of a... Um, undulation in the indicator because the, the actual flange isn't perfectly flat. So right there. I don't really want to hit into the indicator, so I'm going to hit on the bottom of the part here. Okay. If I get this within a... Oh, I mean, it's, it's going to jump here. Oh, that's weird. If I get this within a thousandth or a couple of thousandths, really, it should, should be good enough for the tolerances that we're dealing with here. See, that's on zero. Like I say, the flange isn't perfectly flat. You can kind of see, here's one of the chuck jaws from the first operation. You might be able to see that right there, the marks the jaw left. And you can see that kind of makes the part move a little bit. Because the pressure on those jaws, because I turn these parts without any tail stock or anything, and, and I want to have those jaws pretty tight. Okay, I'm kind of happy with that for right now. Now we're going to change to the other indicator and, and start getting our run out. We'll, we'll have to go... I like to use this one inch travel indicator, by the way, for doing this as opposed to that other one because it has obviously more travel and the parts running out more than that, probably more than that indicator can handle travel-wise. I don't know if I can do this with the camera here. Let's see. Try it. Um, it might be that my uh, wrench. Okay, it's actually we're running pretty good. Only running out about six thousandths of an inch. So the bottom needs to be tightened up. I'm going to re zero the indicator right there. I may have to tighten. I'm fairly close to zero, so I'm going to tighten this jaw on the bottom. Push that up towards the indicator. I'm going to go beyond zero. I don't want to get too carried away here, actually, though. I might still have to I might still have to tap the part okay this I don't know if you can see anything like that probably see the wrench real good I'm going to re-zero myself here with the x-axis I don't want to It's not too bad on that set of jaws. This one I'm going to come up with a little more. Okay. I think I'm going to stop right there for that. Now I'm going to check the flange again on the back of the flange with the other indicator. This is actually better for you guys to be able to see it here because 
the other one, the light reflects off it, and, but it's, it's more difficult for me to see what's happening here. Okay, see, adjust tightening those jaws made that run out a little bit. So that is going away from the indicator. I think that's away. Yeah. And so this is coming into the indicator. So see if I can move it here. Have to hit it quite a bit harder. It's sort of hitting a glancing blow on the bottom of the jaw on the part here. So I don't want to I don't want to hit it into the indicator. I don't like doing that. Oh, what am I doing? I'm hitting it on the wrong side. Got to get the maximum deviation in that direction. I can't really hit it on top here. It wouldn't, I wouldn't mind hitting it here like this, but I can't do that, particularly with the camera being right there. I got that one spot that's a little bit warped on this flange. You can kind of see it there. The, um, tightening those jaws distorted this flange a little bit. It wasn't, there's a spot right there where it runs out more than it was before I had those jaws tight. That might be as good as it's gonna get. See, there's this one spot right there that, unfortunately, it's kind of like the flange is warped or something. Let's see if I can hit it. Wow. A little bit difficult to do with this camera right here. I want to hit the dial indicator. I might have to live with that right there. That's, that's good enough for the tolerance of the part. I might be just getting a little too picky here. Okay, so let's check the OD again real quick. To make sure that's not too far off. Might have to tweak something there a little maybe. We'll see. We kind of just re-zero that out there. Hopefully this is running true enough. If it's running within a thousandth of an inch, I'm not gonna do anything to it. Looks like it is. I hope you could see that. Maybe, maybe I should turn that indicator more towards the camera. Maybe you can see that a little better. Can move this over here. See, that's running pretty good. Uh, the back of the flange, what was it running out about almost two thousandths in one little spot? But it, it's kind of a little bit warped. And that's due to these, uh, you can see the marks right here maybe. See that where the solid jaws were on here and they're, they're pulling the part back like this. Whenever these jaws in a, in a master jaw in a chuck, right here when you chuck onto something, this jaw pivots back, particularly seeing as I had the jaws about halfway out. There's not as much bearing on the, on the slots in the chuck. And it pushes out and when that happens, the part hits up maybe against the face of the jaws and it gets pulled back. So when you release the pressure on those jaws, when you have them that's as tight as I had them, it kind of warps this, this flangel spring back a little bit after you machine it. And in this case, it's not critical. It's not really, doesn't really matter. But uh, it's just something to be aware of if you have to hold, you know, very close tolerances. We put this, the Hamer indicator in here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring the, the B-axis to 90 degrees so we can touch off on the back of here because we know where this is. The front of that, we don't know where anything is.
I'm going to bring this to Y0, although technically that shouldn't be totally necessary. Bring this up. Be careful I don't jog it into the part. Now on this machine, let me show you something here. You see this area right back here? You got to be kind of careful when you're doing stuff like this because you can run the machine into things, especially right there. Somebody actually right here, somebody did it before before I owned the machine and it, this was all bent over, these, these little flanges. And so I just cut it out and actually it helps drain cool and then shavings get out of there a little easier because that catches shavings up there anyway. But it's been run into, I don't know if you can make out the, if I get the camera closer, you can see. And, and I hammered this out. I took this steel thing off of here when I was doing something to the machine. And there was a big dent right here. See where you can, you can run that thing right into there because the, the travel of the machine, it, it does have a limit of travel, so it'll only go that far. You can see up here with the tool changer door, and, and it's up against the limit switch right now, the, the soft limit, but it can, it can run into something down this direction. I'm not gonna jog it down there because I hit my indicator, but, but uh, so you kinda gotta be careful of that kind of stuff with this machine. If, and particularly if you're turning with tools or, or milling back here, close to the jaws, you can hit that thing up there on something. It's not, if you're not kind of paying attention to that. So, gonna jog this up to zero on the back of this flange. Now this is one and a half inches from the zero of the, of the um, face of the part, or one and a half inches from the finished face of the part. So, now that we got that on zero, we'll go over here. See if I can do this. And we want to uh, go to work offset. We want to bring our Z offset down here. And then we want to teach. We want to teach one and a half inches positive. Which we enter over here, push input, and that'll change that number. If, if we hit reset, we should be setting at minus one and a half inches with our, uh, with our indicator at zero there. So our actual zero is out here one and a half inches. So that's the way I set that. And that way it'll, uh, it'll make the part an inch and a half thick here.
I don't know if you've noticed, but I um, I found that if I spray this this Rain-X in the airline coming up to the camera, that it kind of helps the you get these streaks coming across the lens, but it kind of um, covers it or um, what did I say? No, it kind of makes it clearer. I don't know if you noticed that in the video. I'm I'm kind of pulling the air nozzle, I mean the air connector out of the compressor. And spraying some of this in it in the line and just plugging it back in and then it blows the rain x up into the um the air knife deal on the on the camera so i'm thinking i'm getting an idea if i could bleed um some of this uh, i don't know a mist of this or a fine amount of this into the airline it would uh it would help me be able to film under those higher coolant conditions maybe it, I've been experimenting with that a little bit. I need to have some way to inject a, a consistent amount, a very small amount, into the air coming up into the camera. That might, that might work. I don't know. But anyway, we've got to get this out of here. Now, 
like I showed you earlier, I got this bushing thing in here that's holding, uh, or around the part, I should say. Like I said on an earlier video, part of the reason for that is I can kind of slide this out of here enough to get a strap on it in front of the chuck like this. I know you can't really see, but I'm putting the strap just in between the part and the chuck, Joss. The other day, the crane guys came out and tested all the cranes for their capacity to, to um, certify their capacity in. And they were, uh, this has gotten broken, this plastic enclosure around the crane's buttons. And they said they would bring some stuff out and repair this. This is kind of a little bit dangerous. I, I've had people even mention this kind of stuff in, in previous videos and comments, and I realize it's, if you, if you grab onto this thing, you can shock yourself. So, you gotta be careful. But uh, on, on, that, uh, on that same note, they tested both of the hoists and they, uh, they passed uh, their load tests fine. Both of my cranes are um, two ton or 4,000 pound crane. They test it with 125% of that, so 5,000 pounds of weight and tested uh, fine. Anyway, this is a very simple part, and I wanted to show this example of programming and setup on a simple piece. Otherwise, the, the video would be kind of long. And people that aren't used to doing this kind of work, I know a lot of you guys that watch my channel already do machine work. And um, yes, I know this could probably be done faster in a lot of different ways. I could have programmed it in straight Maze Troll, which actually I rarely use. I, I usually mostly use the cam software when I'm doing uh, this machine. Uh, on uh, Even though it does have a conversational format on the Maze Troll controller, I, uh, I prefer using my cam software because I can get things the way I want and I can see a simulation on the uh, software that is much more precise than the, than the safety barriers on the Mazak here and you have to define them every time you change something like Chuck Jaws and this and uh, it's just easier to do in the cam software but I do realize that for simple turning jobs like this just this was mostly just turning and putting some holes it's um it's a lot quicker to do on the maze troll this kind of job but some of these other jobs i've shown in videos for that long titanium part with all the holes and all the angle holes and everything that turns out to be much more difficult to do on maze troll than it does on the cam software so there's kind of a balance there um and you know people make comment oh i could program this in in Two minutes, no, you can't program even this part in two minutes on Maze Troll. Don't even talk like that. I mean, you could probably do it in 10 or 15 minutes and it'd be fine. But two minutes, no, you can't. I'm sorry. So anyway, this is the completed part as I demonstrated in this little uh, set of videos on, on this thing. There's, there's a, I'm making actually um, two other versions of a, of a kind of similar shaft over here. Let me get the camera, I'll show you. So that's, that's the part that I, that's in the machine that I just finished that style. And then there's these two other ones and these two longer ones. And these have um, holes on the end of them here that have to be in aligned to the, to the holes in the flange and so what I typically do here, you can see it right here, is put this little, I mill this little um, alignment hole here so I can indicate this when I turn the part around and to make sure that what I did on the end of the part over there lines up to these holes in the flange here. It just, uh, it, this isn't even where the part is, it gets machined away. Now there's different ways to do this. You could do it like this or you could mill a flat 
on here. Uh, this is just a little bit hard when the insert cuts into it on the roughing tool, but it's not that bad. It's a very small little hole there, and it's only about 100 thousandths deep. So anyway, that's I got to finish these up. But this is the part. If you can see down the hole, I bored this hole on this part because I don't have a. Well, I think I mentioned it before. I don't have a drill this size, and the boring leaves a lot nicer finish in here than a drill would. And I also milled these holes. There again, I didn't have a, a .780 drill, and so I had a .720 drill, and then I just milled them out to .780, and it, and it ends up looking nicer. And I think the holes might be in a slightly better location doing that. So this is that bushing thing that I put in between the part and the jaws, so it doesn't ding the part up, and I can kind of wrestle it in and out of there. See, there's a lot of shavings that get up in there, and you can easily miss some of those and then you tighten the jaws down on the part and you dent the part and I didn't want to do that. And you can see even still this aluminum. These jaws, I didn't bother to bore them precisely. They, they already are about this size. And I, with a four jaw chuck, you don't really have to worry too much about that. So I didn't rebore the jaws. You could rebore those jaws and if you're real careful keeping things clean, you wouldn't need this, of course. But like I say, dragging the part in and out of the chuck like that, you're going to scratch it if you're not care very careful. And I, I don't like my parts to have a bunch of scratches and everything all over them or, or dents. You know, I, I see people on YouTube, believe it or not, you know, they're, they're uh, drilling in the milling vise and stuff and they're just flipping the part around and they're not cleaning the jaws uh, or on the drill press or whatever. You know, not cleaning the table, all these shavings, they're just drilling into there and and uh, man, to myself, I just can't really do that. I gotta keep things clean so I don't have, um, you know, so the finishes end up looking nice. Now, I didn't put chamfers on, I could have programmed chamfers on these holes. I know somebody will comment on that. But, um, you know, and go through here with a back chamfer tool. But to me, for two parts, I'm just gonna deburr it with a hand grinder. It's just, you know, or you could even use a whirly burr on here. And it's just easier, and I don't want to go to the trouble of having to set that tool up and everything to have to do all that. So that's the part. I could put the other one in the chuck and uh, run the program. It's, it'll go pretty quick on the second time. You run the first program, and you got to be a little more careful. You don't know 100% what's going to happen on the second one. You can kind of run through it quicker.